Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our oral surgery series. So in the last video, we discussed all the steps for a simple tooth extraction. And a lot of those concepts will apply here as well. So definitely watch that video first if you haven't already. So in this video, we're going to dive into the exciting topic of surgical extractions. Now surgical extractions involve surgical access by elevating a mucoperiosteal flap. Now for flaps, the same rules generally apply that we talked about in the periodontics videos. We want a wide base to maintain vasculature, cut to the line angles of teeth, make the flap sufficiently large so you can get good access and visibility. All these concepts I will review in the next slide. Now as soon as I pick up a surgical handpiece and take it to the patient's mouth, it becomes a surgical extraction. So a surgical handpiece can be used to remove bone and or section the extracted teeth. So I'll talk about those concepts a bit later in this video. And sutures are generally used in order to close up the flaps that we raised before. Now don't be scared to pick up a handpiece and they shouldn't be reserved only for extreme situations because a handpiece can actually help an extraction become much easier. So this is the same slide from our periodontic series because again, the same principles apply. Flaps are used for better access and visibility to the area that we're working with. So the top of the flap is up where the teeth were and it's the loosely hanging edge here is called the free margin. And the bottom or base of the flap is still attached to the underlying bone. Now the base should be wider than the free margin in order that a minimal amount of vasculature is severed and the top of the flap can remain well vascularized and vital after surgery is completed. Here's an example where the base is narrower than the free margin and so that's not a good example of what we want. Incisions should be over intact bone, not over bony defects, or on the other hand, bony eminences. We want rounded corners of the flaps, and so we don't want any sharp edges. Just like in anything in dentistry, we want generally smooth, round edges. Vertical releases should be at the line angles of the teeth. This is because if we were to drop a, a cut on a flap mid papilla, that often causes a loss of papilla. And if we drop a flap mid facial to the tooth, say we were dropping it maybe on this molar right down here, and this is where our vertical incision ended up, we often would cause recession of that involved tooth. So instead of being mid papilla, mid facial, we go in the middle and drop those vertical incisions to the line angles of those respective teeth. And because we're doing extractions, you certainly want the flap margin to be at least one or, two, one or two teeth away from the teeth you're working on on intact sound bone. We wanna also avoid vital structures. Be careful high up in the labial maxilla where the infraorbital vessels are and the lingual mandible. There's a lot of thin tissue and the lingual artery is down there. You also want to avoid the mental nerve and the, the mental, uh, the vessels associated with that foramen if doing a mandibular flap, especially around the mandibular second premolars. And all of our flaps used in oral surgery should be full thickness flaps. Those are those mucoperiosteal flaps. Remember that means including the periosteum layer. Whereas in periodontics, we sometimes didn't want to do a full thickness and we would do a partial thickness flap instead. So that is one of the differences here. We're talking purely about full thickness flaps. So the types of mucoperiosteal flaps, there are a couple. The envelope flap has zero vertical releases, so there are no zero, there are no vertical incisions here. The three-cornered flap has one vertical release, and then this one goes straight to the line angle, no vertical release on this side. And the trapezoidal is what I was showing you in the previous slide, where we have two vertical incisions. Again, remember those should be done over intact sound bone and should be dropped to the line angles of those teeth. 
We also have some miscellaneous flaps that are asked about on the board exam. The semilunar incision refers to an incision made apical to the mucogingival junction, and it's done for apicoectomy. That's a endodontic surgery that we talked about in the endodontic series. And an apically displaced flap is impossible in the maxillary palatal region. So we're only doing this on the labial surface because for an upper tooth because the maxillary palatal tissue is attached. It's firmly attached to the underlying bone. So it doesn't release like maxillary facial, mandibular facial, and even mandibular lingual tissue would. So the palate is firmly attached tissue and it won't be easily displaced. So we cannot do an apically displaced flap in that region. And I have seen that asked on the board exam. The double Y incision is an incision down the midline of the palate, and there are two vertical releases at each end. And why it's called a double Y, we have a Y here, and the other Y is cut off from this image, and it's down here, so we'll just draw that in so we have it. So we have two Ys that meet in the center, and this is done for a palatal torus removal. Here we see the palatal torus, and we want, again, nice, uh, we want nice access and visibility to what we're working on, so we lift those tissues out of the way so we have a clean access to the underlying torus. So these are great incisions to know for the board exam, know why they're used and how they're done. So for surgical extractions, they're typically reserved for more difficult extractions, but again, don't be afraid to go into the surgical territory to make an extraction go smoother. But we can, as part of our preparatory phases, look at what could potentially make this extraction difficult. And there are a lot of things that we can keep in mind when preparing for an extraction. The first is if we notice divergent roots. That would make an extraction more difficult just by the physics of how the roots would be splayed and it's dif more difficult to deliver the tooth from the socket. Root dilacerations, where they're bent in weird ways, that is also makes sense, it would make a, an extraction more difficult. And endodontically treated tooth. This kind of tooth tends to be a bit more brittle, and the internal dentin has been, some of that internal dentin has been removed as part of the endodontic treatment, and so the tooth is weaker structurally, so it's more prone to breaking and cracking on you. Root resorption can make an extraction more difficult. Long roots, more surface area, more PDL to deal with. Dense bone, like we talked about, the posterior mandible has the densest bone, and, and hence the most difficult extractions tend to be in that region. Root fracture, if a tooth, say, has a vertical root fracture, that's, a, that's an indication to have that tooth extracted, but it's also a very difficult extraction because you're very unlikely to get that tooth out in one shot. Proximity to the floor of the sinus or the inferior alveolar nerve. Again, we want to avoid those vital structures and that's where we have potential for some complications. Limited opening. This means that's going to be harder for you to access the tooth you're working on. To get those instruments, you have to get the periosteal elevator and the dental elevator and the forceps all the way back there, say in the a wisdom tooth region, and they have limited opening. That can make for a very difficult extraction just because of that. Bruxism, this one uh, may not be immediately evident, but a patient who's a Bruxer, clencher, grinder, they're going to have stronger periodontal ligaments, just like somebody who works out their muscles frequently. Somebody who's clenching and grinding a lot, their PDLs are getting a lot of stimulation. So they're going to be stronger, harder to break up, and harder to get that tooth out. Exostoses or tori, this is dense bone that can limit that expansion of the bone buccally and lingually. Remember, that's one of our main concepts. We want to sever the periodontal ligament and the gingival fibers, and we also want to expand that bone so that we can first move that tooth and then remove it. So that can make it a little bit more difficult. Gross caries, these sorts of extractions, the crowns just tend to crumble. And so you end up with a lot of uh, retained roots that can be difficult to extract, and we'll talk about that a bit later. 
and severe crowding. This is another one that's not uh, immediately evident, but severe crowding can impede our ability to place forceps appropriately. And so it's a little bit more difficult to access the area and also we're more prone to damage adjacent teeth if they're severely crowded. So if you have an extraction that seems difficult before you even start, then you may plan to raise a flap and break out the handpiece to start with. Other times you need to convert from a simple extraction to a surgical extraction technique halfway through. You can tackle a difficult extraction with any or all of these methods to remove buccal bone, remove interradicular bone, and or to section the tooth. So let's talk about each of these three. So first we can remove buccal bone. And as this image is showing, you can remove bone between the tooth and the cortical bone in order to create a ditch or a trough. So the idea of making a trough is so that you can enter the dental elevator into that trough and essentially make a purchase point for yourself in order to luxate the tooth. Maybe you didn't have great leverage, mesial or distal to that tooth, and so you had to make a little trough for yourself in order to enter that dental elevator in there and get some resistance against the cortical plate. So creating a purchase point is one part, and then also a pathway for delivery. Removing some bone height can allow you to deliver that tooth in a buccal direction where that bone has been reduced. Similarly, we can remove interradicular bone. Again, this is to remove bone between the tooth and the harder cortical bone in order to create a ditch or a trough. And like we were talking about before, this is just a different way of saying it, we move the center of resistance apically and facilitate tooth removal. As we remove bone height, that center of resistance of that tooth moves apically, and we have more space and uh, more space superiorly to that to deliver that tooth. Now, if that patient's going to receive an implant in that area, we have to be careful removing too much bone because bone, especially buccal bone, is very, very important in order to support that implant. We want to do socket preservation and do an atraumatic extraction if at all possible. So we want to be careful with removing too much bone especially if there are future plans to place an implant in that area. Our last option, perhaps the most common option in uh, oral surgery with general dentists, is to section the tooth. That tooth is going to be removed anyway, and the patient's already numb, so they're not going to need that tooth, and they're not going to feel drilling through that tooth, through the pulp, and all of that. So sometimes a great strategy is to use the surgical burr to split the tooth in half. For a, for a lower molar, it is indeed in half as you're splitting the tooth essentially into a mesial portion and a distal portion. And each portion has its own root, as you can see with the dashed lines going into the bone. So you use the surgical burr to split the tooth in half, and then you can insert an elevator into that split in order to complete the break, if you haven't already with the burr. And then you simply extract each piece separately, like they're two premolars. You can elevate against each root, and you can get some luxation that way, and then insert the for forceps. You can use root tip forceps, or your normal, in this case, 151, universal 151, and you can deliver the two roots separately. And so sometimes that can be a very nice option in order to uh, convert a more complex extraction, something with uh, more than one root, into two uh, simpler extractions, each of these two sections with just one root. Same thing with an upper molar. You can use a surgical burr to split the tooth, but this time in three pieces, one for each root. Of course, the upper molars typically have three roots. We have the the mesiobuccal, the distobuccal, and then the larger palatal root. And so we need to section the upper molar in three cuts, sort of like a peace sign, in order to separate each root and then extract them individually. So let's talk about a removal of a root tip. Sometimes these can be uh, much more difficult than they would appear to be, 
And But there are several methods in order to safely and efficiently remove a root tip. The main thing you want to keep in mind is especially for a maxillary first molar root tip, for example, we don't want to be pushing that root tip into the sinus area, which can be pretty easy to do. So one method is to gouge into the adjacent bone with the root tip pick that we talked about in our second video in order to create some leverage and, and remove that tooth, sort of almost wedging in between the bone and that little root tip all the way down at the base of the socket. Another thing we can do is take out that surgical burr again, remove some buccal or facial bone, and then elevate that root tip facially through the access that we created. The other idea is to make a bone window at the apex and then push the root through that access hole essentially. Probably the most technique sensitive, but it can be atraumatic in the sense that it's a small cut that you have to make through the bone in order to deliver that root. So those are three methods that we can use as part of a, a more surgical approach or a more simple approach in order to remove some of those pesky root tips. Now at the end of a surgical extraction, the same CSI principle post-extraction that I talked about in the last video is definitely relevant. We want to make sure we're curetting and making sure that we're irrigating that socket and also smoothing bone where appropriate. And we want to, of course, give clear post-op instructions to the patient in order to facilitate healing, keep pressure on the area with gauze, a soft diet, no negative pressure, so no sucking on a straw or any forceful spitting that would dislodge that clot, no smoking, all of those considerations. We have to clearly tell the patient that their role is very important once they go home to take care of this, this uh, tooth extraction. All right, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed our two videos here on simple and surgical extractions. And we'll continue in a bit talking about some more uh, surgery, some implant stuff, some orthognathic surgery. So a lot of things to look forward to in this series. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons over there for their support. You can unlock extras like access to these video slides to take notes on and some additional practice questions. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone. I'll see you all in the next video.